Revelation 13, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. So this is the Antichrist. This Antichrist, he is going to get wounded in the head. He's going to get a head injury. Now, it's important to keep this in mind because I want you to compare that with Zechariah. We're going to look at the book of Zechariah chapter 11. This is more detailed on what the Antichrist will undergo. Let's look at Zechariah chapter 11. Why Islam is in a very crucial part to our history, and I'm going to give you my thoughts on it, okay? I don't take it as a theory. I take it as my own personal belief, all right? But it is not doctrine. I want to make that very clear, Amen. okay? Let's look at Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 17. The Bible says, Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. So Zechariah 11 is more detailed. It tells you that the Antichrist, when he gets that head injury, it's more so at his right eye. It's in this area here. He's getting the injury. But the injury will also go on his arm as well. It's going to go upon his arm. So it's very possible it, uh, the injury is going to somehow aim over this area. Now the thing is this. It says the sword, right? the sword. I'm open to interpretation that it could be uh, the author is just giving the best word that he could use that basically a weapon is going to be assassinated by a weapon. So if it's a gun or a shotgun, I'm open to that. But I'm wondering if the verse is more literal than we think. So if it says sword, it will be sword. Now in the Quran, it does specifically say that if there's a uh, person who's an infidel or an unbeliever, and those two meanings basically mean if you're not a Muslim, okay? Yeah, right. It's plain and simple in the Quran, okay? So in the Quran, it says that if they are not a Muslim, that they are to be injured or killed by a sword. Now notice that the Antichrist, he's dead. He was wounded to death. He died. He was killed by a sword. A Muslim is necessary to cause a stirring or violence to the government system. Let me repeat that again. For a new world order system that the Antichrist is going to run, there has to be terrorist or Muslim terrorist involved. All right, now that's what the Bible prophesied, okay? We know that, or I know that, that's my personal belief, all right? But think about this. How do tribulation saints die? They are what? Beheaded right? Think about this. Those Jews will be persecuted by the Antichrist, correct? Yeah. All right. His job is to pretend he's in peace treaty terms with them, but he betrays them and has them killed, right? What better people than the Arabs who are upset? Come on. And then they kill the Jewish tribulation saints, and how are they supposed to die according to the word of God? In the Quran, it mentions that you're supposed to cut off the hands and the head yeah. with the sword. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So the thing is this, is that if the Muslim will abide by their belief, if they will abide by that, and the Antichrist will use them to persecute the tribulation Jews, their role is important for the new world order. So if their role is that important, to, they need to be used. Yeah. See, they need to be used by the Antichrist. They need to be used by the Antichrist new world government, one world government. So basically they need to be pawns for him. What if what we're about to study during the 90s and 2000s, your world will not be the same, and you found out that the one world government uh, has used, and I'll just say M, okay? And you know what I mean by that, right? Yep. So, what if our one world government is going to use M for their purposes? Okay, so I'm going to give you a lot of interesting stuff. And it'll be very eye-opening. But there's no doubt the standard interpretation that you hear about current tragedies and how we're facing the M today, all right? is not really the standard uh, interpretation you hear from mainstream media or what your, or what your government says. 
Well, you're gonna find out it's something sketchy, all right? And there's no doubt M is involved, okay? But you can't really put the blame on them. There's no way they could have done all that because we're talking about one of the most powerful countries in the world. So unless there's a weakening in their system or there's a plot or there's a, uh, uh, how do I say this? I'm using words carefully, yeah. right? Yeah, so, so, but you all know what I mean, right? Yeah. So unless it was organized, it was pre-planned, right? That would be interesting. It would make sense. Okay, now, uh, but we'll come to them soon. I got to cover the apostasy here, okay? All right, uh, let's cover the, ba uh, the Baptists. Remember, the Baptists have apostatized. I read that from uh, Dr. Upman's books. Uh, and the two main groups you want to know are neo-evangelicals and charismatics. Now, I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to read from my uh, master's thesis. So, sorry, <laughs> uh, there's no book on it, all right? I'm just reading my master's thesis. And then um, you can look it up yourselves, okay? And the, the documentation, okay? So I'm going to be reading uh, my master's thesis here. This is, uh, they have a major and a minor thesis. This is my minor thesis. I covered the New Year Evangelicals, Charismatics, and the Fundamentalists, actually. So that was my minor thesis. And coincidentally, it, it is crucial for this lesson. All right. All right, now let's, uh, so let's first talk about the neo-evangelicals. Where did that come from? What does that mean? Pastor, what do you mean by that? Okay, so what we are is that uh, when you hear evangelicals or neo-evangelicals, these are people who believe in spreading Christianity around the world. So we are evangelical, you have to understand. We are evangelical. Our movement is to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the standard evangelical that people will think about is one named Billy Graham. Yeah. All right, so that's his whole purpose. But you notice that these people go to great compromises to be able to spread their Christianity. So that's why they're called new evangelicals or neo-evangelicals. Basically, they're sucked in by the modern movement. A lot of them are from old-time fundamentalists and Baptists. That's important to understand. They are, a dis they are a younger generation that got discontented with the older generation. This is the younger generation that grew up listening to too much worldly music, saw too much TV, worldly dressing, went to public schools, got brainwashed by that, and they're like, we should minister to them by meeting the world's levels. See, Great Awakening Revival, they didn't have that. That's why denominations weren't a big deal that time. But this modernism movement and wrong doctrine are the two biggest criminals why we have to make now, we have to be nitpicky on the right denomination and on doctrine. So you have to understand that. People don't understand our history. Okay. Now, the neo-evangelicals, I'm going to read right here. During the battle between modernism and fundamentalism in the 1900s, a group of younger men arose who had been raised in fundamentalist homes and churches. They were trained in completely secular or liberally oriented religious schools and considered to be bright and aspiring scholars. Eventually, these young scholars were dissatisfied with the views of the fundamentalists over the intolerance of liberalism, method of separation, and loss of denominations. Okay, you already heard about the fundamentalists, all right? We'll come back to them a little later and expand them, but I've already given you a history of them, right? All right, continuing on. Later on, they came to the conclusion that the main problem with fundamentalism was separation. Ooh, hear that? Come on. All right, they are compromisers. They believe in ecumenical movement, these guys, because we're too separatist, legalist. How, how often do you hear that term in churches now, right? That's the accusation. But remember, I told you, separation was so crucial because modernism infected everybody. So we have to make a very big deal. We have to have standards, okay? Uh, let's see right here. They were embarrassed over the less position and influence of the fundamentalists. Later on, they came to the conclusion that the main problem with fundamentalism was separation. The doctrine of the inerrancy of the scriptures became more of a stumbling block to these young evangelicals. They were also the pressures of ecumenicalism. At those times, many Laodicean Christians wanted to be in favor of tolerating the first president of Fuller Theological Seminary, Harold Akinga. 
coined the term New Evangelical at the convocation of Fuller in 1948. He described New Evangelical in the following quote, Neo Evangelicalism was born in 1948. That's what he says, quote, in connection with the convocation address which I gave in the Civic Auditorium in Pasadena. While reaffirming the theological view of fundamentalism, this address, this address repudiated its ecclesiology and its social theory. The ringing call for repudiation of separatism and the summons to social involvement received a hearty response from many evangelicals. See that social thing? That's the heart of the stupid uh, liberals, modernism, MLK, and Baptists who compromise with politics. See, that social thing, that social thing. We're not into that. We're separatists. Remember, America was founded on what? Separatists. Yeah. They called themselves separatists because they separated themselves from the church. They weren't like Calvinists. No, we'll stay and purify it. That's how America became a great nation, is you separate from the wickedness, from the evil. That's how you're supposed to do it. All right, that's why the churches aren't great anymore. All right. Uh, let's see. Harold Hawk and, uh, continues, the name caught on and spokesmen such as Drs. Harold Linzel, Carl F.H. Henry, Edward Carnell, and Gleason Archer supported this viewpoint. We had no intention of launching a movement, but found that the emphasis attracted widespread support and exercised great influence. Neo-evangelicalism, different from fundamentalism in its repudiation of separatism and its determination to engage itself in the theological dialogue of the day. It had a new emphasis upon the application of the gospel to the sociological, political, and economic areas of life. No, no, and no. All right. You notice the majority of Christian churches is this movement. That's why I have to start with them. You need to know that. And remember, these guys wouldn't have existed if it weren't for the fundamentalists and Baptists to begin with. All right. Originally, during the Great Awakening Revival, there was no such thing as a neo-evangelical who went with the social polit. There was no such thing. They were fundamentalists in mindset. A lot of them were Baptists in their distinctive, even the people who were affected by the Great Awakening Revival. But this Blankety blank ruined everything. All right? That's how the church is messed up, is this kind of movement. Like I told you, Christians are the one to blame for the apostasy. Don't blame it on the elites. Don't blame it on the Catholics. Don't blame it on Muslims. Don't blame it on the liberals. It's the Christians themselves, okay? One of the incidents, uh, so that's the end of his quote by Akinga. So you got to know this guy, okay? He's a scholar. He's the one. That's where we get the idea of neo-evangelicals. It's this guy. He introduced the history of it, why it came out, the di different denominations, why they followed this movement, okay? Uh, one, of the <coughs> one of the incidents for the rise of neo-evangelicalism occurred when the magazine Christianity Today started in 1956. That's a popular Christian source. That's that neo-evangelical garbage, all right? Yeah. They wrote two articles, Beyond the Fundamentalist Modernist Controversy and Dare We Renew the Controversy, which expressed their views favoring new evangelicalism. These articles express so much time has been wasted on fighting the battles with modernism that evangelicals should now progress to more productive efforts. <laughs> they forgot our war. They forgot the song, I'm going to die on the battlefield. I'm going to die in this war. Bunch of, bunch of panty-wearing Christians. That's what they are nowadays. That's why we messed up and we're in this mess today. All right, I got a lot to read. I don't have time to preach. Okay. All right, the major influence for the rise of new evangelicalism, you can guess if you're going to think of a name, all right, is Billy Graham, all right? But look at this. He was one of the fundamentalist guys. All right, he was one of the fundamentalists, but he went up, he was apostatizing here, okay? As a young boy, he got saved under Mordecai Ham's preaching against the moral laxity in local high schools. In the fall of 1936, Graham started to enter Bob Jones College and became close with Bob Jones Sr. So see that? Bob Jones Sr. He was the, uh, one of those uh, big names for the fundamentalist crowd, remember? Old-time Methodist guy, okay? 
Graham's ministry began at a small church in a suburb of Chicago and also did street preaching on corners, believe it or not. While an organization called the Youth for Christ was growing rapidly, Graham became a well-known youth speaker in that group. That's the uh, remnants from Billy Sunday. All right, that, that place is still there in Indiana. I visited there, okay? It's really neat, actually. It's really neat. I got to see some of that. Uh, la, 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 la. Uh, he later resigned and decided to go into full-time evangelism. As an evangelist, Graham was a strong fundamentalist and separated himself from apostasy. At a young age, he became a friend of William B. Riley and eventually took over Riley's Northwestern schools. Remember William B. Riley? I remember that's a big name that influenced Jerry Falwell and Billy Graham, remember. William B. Riley was during those heydays of fundamentalists, remember. Uh, following, close to the second, uh, following close to the last Great Awakening. Graham also became a member of the cooperating board of the Sword of the Lord. Now, that's a very important name because they're the king, one of the kings of fundamentalists today, Sword of the Lord. All right, they're in newspapers. My dad still has that, actually. Okay? I actually wrote a letter to them. So. All right, anyway. Yeah, Dr. Ottman actually posted that, uh, used parts of that letter that, that I wrote to them for his bulletin. But anyway, that's a whole other story. All right. That was pretty neat. But anyway, okay. Uh, I'm going back to the past. I'm yakking. Here we go. Sorry. He was, a, he was a member of the cooperating board of the Sword of the Lord, and he was honored with a degree from Bob Jones University, too. So then what happened to Billy Graham, right? You know, Oswald J. Smith once said of Billy Graham, quote, again and again, he urged the converts to get linked up with some Bible-believing church where Christ is preached, end of quote. The famous Oswald J. Smith said that about him. Uh, a well-known Methodist pastor named Bob Schuler. Okay, so remember Bob Schuler. He was the fighting Schuler of the, uh, of the old-time Methodist fundamentalists. He said this, quote, None of the great evangelists had ever before accepted the sponsorship of modernists. Billy himself had not only refused to hold a campaign under their sponsorship, but had openly declared that he never would. Would you think? I mean, he, was like, he said that before with the modernists. He was against the modernists that time. In his Los Angeles campaign, I personally saw and heard him, I heard him turn down and politely decline the approval and cooperation of the Church Federation. Remember who that is? That's the enemy, that's our anti-church history enemy, mm -hmm. which represented the Federal Council, now the National Council. Remember the National Council of Christian Churches or Churches? That's our enemy, that's our anti-church history, guys. They knew who to aim for. They were aiming for the big boys, see? They would, so they want their hands on Billy Graham. Billy Graham fell. End of quote. Billy Graham undoubtedly once stood on the fundamental beliefs and separation from other religions. However, gradually over the years, he has moved farther from his original position as a fundamentalist and became closer to the new evangelical movement. In 1957, at a New York City crusade, which sponsored the liberal Protestant council and featured prominent theological modernists, Billy Graham attended there and spoke with no offense. At a preparatory banquet held the previous fall, September 17, 1956, at the Hotel Commodore in New York, Graham stated that he wanted Jews, Catholics, and Protestants to attend his meetings and then go back to their own churches. This New York crusade incident had Graham break ties with Bob Jones Sr., John R. Rice, and other fundamentalists at that time. Because Catholic churches are anti-church history, guys. In a May 30th, 1997 interview with David Frost, Graham said, quote, I feel I belong to all the churches. I'm equally at home in an Anglican or Baptist or a Brethren Assembly or a Roman Catholic Church. And the bishops and archbishops and the Pope are our friends." End of quote. At one, one time he admitted, quote, the ecumenical movement has broadened my viewpoint. End of quote. Around 1967, Graham was awarded an honorary degree from Roman Catholic Belmont Abbey College. And he said in his acceptance speech, quote, the gospel that built this school and the gospel that brings me here tonight is still the way to salvation. 
What are you talking about? The Catholic Church, don't forget the conspiracies, don't forget our enemy. They're not only controlling politics, they're controlling religion. So now they were aiming, now notice that they're aiming for the churches and the Christian churches are falling because of our enemy. Never forget our enemies, guys, all right? The Catholic Church has always been pivotal, even especially the Charismatics, you'd be surprised, okay? But anyway. John R. Rice, he's the founder of the Sword of the Lord, all right? I'll explain a little bit more about him, all right? So he's a famous guy for fundamentalists. He explains his sad story of how he tried to persuade Billy Graham to separate himself from the heretical religions in the world. This is what Rice said, quote, I talked with Dr. Graham again and again about the danger of yoking up with modernism. Again and again, he assured me that he had vowed to God he would never have a man on his committee who was not right on the inspiration of the Bible, the deity of Christ and such matters. I visited Dr. Graham in his own home in Montreat, North Carolina, by his invitation, and we talked earnestly on such matters. Again and again, we have talked by long-distance telephone, sometimes as long as 30 minutes. At his own request, we sent him the Sword of the Lord airmail week after week, in his tour around the world. I wrote him in great detail on matters where I thought he was wrong. And all the time I defended him openly and publicly, excusing his mistakes, until he openly declared he had decided to keep company with modernists and put them on his committees and to go under their sponsorship. Then I was compelled in order to be true to Christ to come out openly against that compromise. The issue is not Billy Graham. I have loved him through the years. I have prayed for him daily for many years. The warm-hearted, friendly Cliff Barrows, the beloved Beverly Shea, the dear friend Jerry Beaven, and the assistant Grady Wilson. God knows how I have prayed for them all. I did all that a good man could do privately to help keep Billy Graham for the historic Christian position and for working with Bible-believing Christians instead of unbelievers." End of quote. Wow. All right. That's a very interesting story, right? All right. Another influence for the rise of new evangelicalism is the founding of the National Association of Evangelicals. This association became an organizational haven for leaders of new evangelicalism. This organization made no official statements about it, but its own approach to the question of the apostasy made it a natural gathering place for the new evangelicals. Many new evangelicals became authors such as Edward Carnell, Carl Henry, Bernard Ram, and produced widespread materials that promoted new evangelicalism. Later on, all right, here are the big names you want to know, all right? Bill Hybels was first, actually, before Rick Warren. So he's not that well-known to maybe some of you, but Bill Hybels was the guy who started that mega church thing for new evangelicals, even before uh, he was older than Rick Warren, if I recall. Robert Schuller is another one of those older guys from Crystal Cathedral. Now it's a church for, guess who, which religion? Catholics. Anti-church history has been following us Christians, and they're going, they want to take over our bunch, influence our bunch. Okay, anyway. Later on, Joel Osteen and other new evangelical pastors like Robert Schuller, Rick Warren, and Bill Hybels brought in contemporary Christian music, worldly practices, and positive preaching to bring in many people, including different denominations, to their churches. Rather, spe rather specifying what denomination that their churches were, they called their churches community or entitled their churches after the name of a city. That's one thing you'll notice about them. They don't make a big deal on denomination. This was done in order to gather everybody into their churches, even those of different religions. Throughout the years, many Christians and lost sinners were brought into new evangelicalism. Let us see what system, uh, okay. So Hillsong is another evidence. Now they're not just bringing different religions, they're bringing the Alphabet Soup Club. And there are testimonials of that from Hillsong. They attended there and they had no, and they just loved it. They just keep attending there. What is that church doing? Okay. All right. Now you understand our churches now. Does this under, did you understand how our churches operate now? You're not going to look at no, churches here normally the same now. Okay. All right. Now the charismatics. You need to hear this bunch. All right. All right. The charismatics uh, from my... We'll start with here. All right, it's important to remember it started with Charles Parham from Bethel Bible School, okay? I'm going to read it here, la 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 la. Charles Parham, the founder of Bethel Bible School, had the same experience in speaking in tongues. 
from that time forward, uh, so this is around uh, 1901 to 1905, okay, during that time. Uh, let's see right here. Uh, from that time forward, Parham preached that all believers who sought the tongues experience diligently would be recipients of the blessing. In 1905, a zealous black preacher named William J. Seymour came under the tutelage of Parham in Alvin, Texas. Seymour soon learned about the tongue's experience and took this message to Azusa Street in Los Angeles around 1906. All right, that's very important, William J. Seymour. Everyone knows the Azusa Street Revival. What's the Azusa Revival? That's the same thing as your uh, previous so-called revival that you had earlier, the Asbury Revival. It's the same thing, nothing different, okay? It ain't a revival, it's demon possession, okay? So Azusa Street Revival, Los Angeles, California. Every bad thing comes out of California, I like to say. Oh, my goodness. All right, then. It was at this place that thousands received the tongues baptism. So it was in Los Angeles. They had a revival. Everyone received that baptism, right? That sparked the spread of the speaking of tongues movement. Okay, guys? Parham and Seymour then began an ambitious effort to spread the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Ghost based on the speaking of tongues throughout the world. Parham and Seymour are both known to be the co-founders of world Pentecostalism. Followers and dispensers of this teaching were known to be Azusa pilgrims. So notice Pentecostalism. When you hear Pentecostal church, it's going to be tied to them. See that? So that's the reason why Pentecostals today, uh, they've been uh, largely influenced by him and they carry on that doctrine. Picking up this doctrine for the speaking of tongues, Amy Semple McPherson promoted it and started the signs of healings in her church. She left her home at 1915 of June and started her ministry by evangelizing and holding tent revivals. Amy Semple McPherson is very important, okay? So she's the one where Benny Hinn really was influenced by, okay? Uh, Catherine Kuhlman and those people, okay? So this name is very important, Amy Semple McPherson. No, she had a tent revival. What's she trying to do? Follow the, because remember during that time, these, uh, Mordecai, Ham, and those guys, the last, the last stage of the Great Awakening was ongoing. So charismatics was seeping and mixing in with that revival, guys. See, that's when it fell apart. That's why we make a big deal on doctrine. See that? We make a very big deal on doctrine. They corrupt and messed up the Great Awakening revivals. Okay. Uh, she first traveled up and down one part of the United States and then expanded her work to other parts of the country. Eventually, she held meetings in all parts of the world. She then was tired of constant traveling and was suddenly called by God to plant a church in Los Angeles. With the money she saved from her evangelism work, she was able to own a large dome church building in the Echo Park area of Los Angeles named Angeles Temple. It's still there. It was at this temple where she founded the Four Square Movement. That's where the Four Square Movement comes from, guys. So they're charismatics. They come from Semple McPherson. Uh, la, 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 la. Here she demonstrated the speaking of tongues and the signs of healings to her congregation. McPherson soon became famously known throughout the world and drew in thousands of people into her church. It is believed that the actual charismatic movement, so that word charismatic, actually began... You wouldn't guess. With who? Father Dennis Bennett of St. Mark's Episcopal Parish in Van Nuys, California. On April 3rd, 1960, he announced to his congregation that he had received the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit by the speaking in tongues. After much opposition, Bennett resigned from his position at St. Mark's and accepted an invitation to become vicar of St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Seattle, Washington. Here he broadly preached about his charismatic movement concerning the tongue, signs, and healings. About a de decade later, about 150 major Protestant families accepted this charismatic movement, eventually reaching about 55 million people by 1990. See, it's been corrupted, all of Christianity now, mainstream Christianity. Yeah. Dr. Vincent Sinan, current charismatic professor of church history, explained how fast this charismatic movement united charismatics and guess who? Catholics. Boom. Yeah. Wow. Evil. So notice that Dr. Upman said that what they received was remnants of fundamentalists and Baptists, right? Mm -hmm. 
they got corrupted by their sin. Notice it had to do with sin, wrong doctrine, and then that anti-church history. When they see their opportunity, they seize it and grab it. They're not going to influence you guys unless you let them. Do you understand? It always starts with sin and wrong doctrine. That's why church, we make a big deal. Don't call me legalist, okay? All right? We make a big deal on standards here about worldliness and then also doctrine. All right? So we make a very big deal on that because that's part of our history. That's why all churches fell apart, guys. So we make a very big deal on worldliness and doctrine, okay? Let's see right here. Uh, this is what he said. Now, he's a charismatic professor of church history. All right, so I'm reading from the horse's mouth here. Quote, the Catholic charismatic renewal movement. That's what he called it. Had its beginnings in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1967 among students and faculty of, uh, I think you pronounce it Duquesne University. <laughs> All right. In the more than 30 years since its inception, the Catholic movement has touched the lives of over 70 million Catholics in over 120 nations of the world. Added to these is the newest category, the third wave of the spirit, which originated at Fuller Theological Seminary. That's that. That's a bunch of idiots who introduced new evangelicalism, remember? Right. Harold Ockenga, those guys. Uh, let's see right here. In 1981, under the classroom ministry of John Wimber, these consisted of mainline evangelicals who moved in signs and wonders, but who disdained labels such as Pentecostal or charismatic because of the denomination label, see? So that's why they didn't call themselves Pentecostal or charismatic. That's why these two bunch are very intertwined, okay? Mm -hmm. Very intertwined. When you go to churches, you'll notice elements of these two, okay? Korea is so bad, all right? That's not even Christianity. That's a cult, okay? But that's a whole nother story. They mingled it with shamanism, Buddhism. If I want to prove these two are heresies, all right, and we make a big deal on doctrine, is my Korean history, all right? Because of those wrong doctrines and that worldliness, they, uh, it was combined with that shamanism, Buddhism culture in Korea. That's the reason why What's the big deal about wrong doctrines in Christian churches, you know? As long as we're all saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hey, fool, you damn my country! Yeah. All right, but anyway, I, that's a whole other story, okay? So I'm not going to get into that one. Yes, I have a thesis on that, okay? <laughs> all right. All right. Man, I just got riled up now talking about this, all right? Because that's our current churches. Like I told you guys, last statement, all right? Last rant. I'd sooner sit down through a Berkeley class and attend one of these church meetings. Okay, and I'm serious. You might say, why? Why, pastor? Because I want something that's genuine all the way, all right? If their liberals are genuine and real what they do, I prefer that one than this mash, this mesh thing of liberal worldliness and Christianity. It makes me want to puke, all right? That's what God said. Yeah. God said, I would thou art hot or cold. Yeah. But because you're mingled, I want to spew you out of my mouth. Yeah, yeah. I, why? Because I cannot come in with a comfortable conscience with Christianity and try to praise the Lord with that worldliness, liberalism combined. Right. I feel like throwing up. I prefer liberalism shoved down my throat and I just reject it. Right. But then when I sit through that church service, it's confusing. There are some good Christian stuff that I just want to say amen to, but then all of a sudden it's mingled with the speaking of tongues and this lovey-dovey Jesus stuff. So then it just gets me confused that I now start to question my gender probably. <sighs> I wonder if I turn out to be like, I wonder if I'm a woman after that church service now. It's too emotional. Uh, uh, lovey-dovey. Never mind. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. All right. You want to get on my nerves, it's uh, these churches, all right? That's one of the ways you can get on my nerves. It's scholars and these bunch, all right? I hate this mingled, mushy-mush Christianity, you know, all right? All right, anyway, I'm not, uh, let me read what he said here, okay? By 1990, the same church history uh, charismatic professor. He quotes, by 1990, this group numbered some 33 million members in the world. In summary, all these movements, both Pentecostal and charismatic, have come to constitute a major force in Christendom throughout the world with explosive growth rates not seen before in modern times. 
By 1990, the Pentecostals and their charismatic brothers and sisters in the mainline Protestant and Catholic churches were turning their attention toward, toward world evangelization. Only time will reveal the ultimate results of this movement, which has greatly impacted the world during the 20th century. Blah, blah, blah. End of quote. All right, so they follow the example of Amy Semple McPherson now. Hundreds of pastors, evangelists, and people are doing that. Oral Roberts is one of those earliest uh, preachers. He was the first to bring healing crusades inside the homes of millions who had never been exposed to the healing message by initiating a national weekly television program. So that's when it got out. At December 2nd, 2001, Kenneth Copeland prophesied that one billion mu Muslims would be saved in the next couple of months. Benny Hinn claimed that he had revelations directly revealed to him by God and was soon world-renowned. The gullible Laodicean Christians believed what the charismatic leader said without even checking them with the scriptures. The biggest push for the charismatic movement is the television network TBN, and that stands for Trinity Broadcasting Network. So they're not a big name anymore, all right? They were getting out of business. There were so many scandals going on, all right, recently. But back, but you got to know this, how people got an idea about these healing jokers and you know this revelation touched the screen is because of TBN guys that's where all the TV came from uh, me and my dad when we had cable TV you know uh, what were we watching we weren't watching worldly stuff we were watching TBN why just for comedy it was like our comedy central channel if that made sense is watching TBN yeah all right because these, I mean, just look at them, okay? If you want your kids to have fun, have them watch these jokers and let them see what kind of pastors to beware. You know, touch the screen in Jesus' name. And, oh, I see a, an arm popping out of that armless body right there. I kid you not, they think stuff like that. <laughs> have your kids watch that. That way your kids don't get influenced by this kind of churches and they, they don't dare attend these, attend these churches. Right. Have them watch that. I, all right. Uh, let's see. It started by Paul and Jen Crouch. All right. Uh, yeah, I know. Funny last name. All right. The program is featured in over 5,000 television stations, 33 satellites, the Internet, and thousands of cable systems around the world. The program can also be translated into different languages at TBN's International Production Center in Irving, Texas. TBN is carried on through 33 international satellites. Because of this program, Oral Roberts, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, John Hagee, Pat Robertson, Jesse Duplantis, Creflo Dollar, Paula White, and many more charismatics were able to become known throughout countries and their charismatic teachings covered throughout the globe. TBN is not a member of the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability and refuses to disclose its financial in situation for public inspection. Because of their refusal, the so-called Christian watchdog group, Wall Watchers, and the, another so-called Christian ministry information and rating group, Ministry Watch, they both graded TBN with an F for its lack of transparency. Later on, an employee of TBN named Enoch Lonnie Ford told the public that in 1996, he was forced into having a homosexual affair with Paul Crouch, the guy who founded TBN. If he did not fornicate with Crouch, he would be terminated from his job, he claimed. The act took place at a TBN-owned cabin near Lake Arrowhead, California. See, everything bad comes from California, guys. You wonder why California ended up being one of the most liberal hellhole places rather than a very Christian place. Do you know, look, do you know where neo-evangelicals, the cream of the crop of charismatic neo-evangelicals came from? Which state? Which state? Here! And you wonder why California is one of the most liberal today. You think this is the fruits of revival? No. This should open your eyes. It's good. I am so angry. So angry at these churches. You got to realize, I get more angry at saved Christian churches more than Catholic churches. You have to understand that. That's why we make a big deal about this bunch. That's why people got to get out of these kind of churches. That's right. Amen. Although Crouch denied the act, he paid $425,000 to Ford to settle the dispute. Yeah. 
Today, Paul and Jan Crouch still run. Uh, no, they don't. This was a minor thesis from five, seven years ago. So no, they, they're still not running. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Within less than a century, ever since William J. Seymour started the spread of the speaking of tongues, literally millions of people entered into the charismatic movement. Many religious people, including Christians, were being sucked toward this movement with all the emotional tongues and healings. Famous charismatic leaders like Oral Roberts, Benny Hinn, Rod Parsley, Paula White, and hundreds of others continued to push and giving the money to their work for God's ministry. The doctrines they taught were not of the Bible. All right, all right that's their history there, okay? I went on a rant on these guys, okay. I'm not gonna get to the interesting parts here. All right, All right. the fundamentalist. Now, the resource that I would recommend is, the author's name is Ed Reese, Ed Reese. So I'm just going, I'm not gonna give you quotes. I'm just gonna tell you the source, my source is Ed Reese, and he has books called uh, Christian Hall of Faith Biography Series. Christian Hall of Faith biography series. I would highly, strongly recommend that. When I was a teenager and in college, those little booklets was what kept me stay as a Bible believer. Because I realized that, man, what, what the life of a Christian is an exciting thing. I want my bi biography to be like that. I don't want a biography of a worldly person. So that changed my life. That's where my church history came from, guys. My masterpiece is from those little booklets. So I'd highly recommend that. If you go to his booklets, here are their names and you can hear their stories, all right? Most of them is best based on Ed Reese's book. The rest of it, you can research yourselves, okay? All right, here are the famous fundamentalists, okay? And there's, uh, you can find some of their sermons on YouTube and the internet. I would highly recommend listening to it. It's really great, okay? Bob Jones Sr., obviously, all right? When you listen to his preaching, it's not usually the quiet voice. A lot of videos would like to show that. BJU would like to show that. But no, that's not his preaching. When you hear his preaching, and I've heard it, he'll scream. Yeah. He'll scream so hard and stomp his foot, actually. Old-time Methodist. Junior is also considered one of the kings of fundamentalists. Now, John R. Rice is also one of the kings of fundamentalists. Uh, because of his Sword of the Lord magazine and newspaper. It's still uh, up today. A lot of fundamentalist big shots today, IFB churches, if they want to be famous, they want to write an article for Sword of the Lord. Okay? They want to be in there. That's how they become famous. How these IFB churches are famous worldwide is, realize this, they didn't have internet. They didn't have TV. They had newspaper. But worldly newspapers won't publish it. Sword of the Lord had that power. See that? So because of that power, that's how these IFB churches become famous. Poor Dr. Upman didn't made it. Okay, so. So John R. Rice, he was the founder of the Sword of the Lord newspaper. Bob Jones Sr. and Jr. Uh, started BJU. Now, uh, not senior really, but BJU and probably, ju yeah, junior. BJU and John R. Rice, these two, man, I mean, uh, they got good stuff, but uh, they did not believe the King James Bible was perfect. Uh, they criticized our Bible-believing heroes, and I'll cover them later on. Third thing is this. These guys try to pretend that they are the champions of fundamentalists. That's what they're trying to do. So there was this pride mentality. That's why this bunch wants to catch dirt on this bunch, because this bunch's problem is legalism and pride. That separation standard made them so prideful, think that you know, I'm the one serving God and I'm saving the world from modernism. And then you find scandal after scandal with this bunch. Heil's legacy, unfortunately, follows that one as well. I don't know about his life. I heard stories. Look, I heard documentations from both sides. All right. So the, I, I went deep into it. And from what I get is I don't know. But I do know his followers and his son and everything that came out followed the scandals. Okay. So it's just a mess, these guys. Pride, legalism, and scandals. That's why these guys get a heyday and want to catch dirt on these guys, okay? So you get some of that right now, all right? Then I get online, and these penny-wasted uh, modernist Christians, you know, act like, oh, he's persecuting me. But these guys were hounding these guys trying to persecute them. Then when I called your hand on it, you whine like a little sissy, you. Yeah. It's good preaching, 
Yeah, amen. Amen and amen. If you don't say amen, I'll say amen to myself. If I lose members, fine, I'll amen myself. I'll be my own church membership and my own pastor, fine. All right? But I'm serious, all right? That's, that's why I stay online, all right? I, I hate online, all right? I would love to get off online. The only thing that keeps me stay online is obviously one, because souls are getting saved and getting into Bible-believing churches. But number two is because of you enemies out there. You motivated me. If you didn't exist, I would not have went online. All right? So blame yourselves, okay? If you want me off online, why don't you get off the ministry? All right. So uh, the fundamentalists, they have this problem with uh, pride, obviously, and legalism. And then that's why scandals came out. That's why I pound very hard on humility, guys, okay? Amen. So we do not want to mess that up. They don't know much doctrine either, but at least they get the fundamentalist doctrines why, right. But that will be a whole other story in history. We'll cover them. But we want to see what God used during that time at least, okay? So the fundamentalists were there. And they kept the fundamentals. They separated from this bunch, okay? That's what kept our movement pure. Bible believers came from fundamentalists, okay? So uh, these had a profound influence. Jack Hiles obviously had a profound influence too. He made it to the top 14 largest churches in America, actually. So he made a huge influence, Jack Hiles. Uh, Lester Roloff is another famous fundamentalist. He, he, fought all, he always fought the government, all right, the state, till the day he died. Uh, if you, uh, he rescued people from life of drugs. He was rescuing teenagers, kids, young adults, and then got them quoting scripture and then uh, singing hymns in front of churches. I mean, you can still see some of those videos. He get a whole bunch of girls over there, dressed clean and quoting scripture or singing hymns. It stirs you up, man. Amen. I would encourage you tonight to look at some of his, um, uh, his daughters, so to speak, yeah. his daughters that he was able to help and rescue, and they're singing hymns for the Lord and everything. It's awesome. Lee Robertson, uh, he's in charge of Tennessee Temple. You'll hear that quite often today. Tennessee Temple schools are very famous. So Lee Robertson, uh, I read a little bit about him, I think, from Dr. Upton's Church History book, but he's a big shot in fundamentalist circles as well. Uh, I think you can find still some of his sermons. Now, these are the two, though, that I starred the most, okay? Because they made it, I think, even to Wikipedia, okay? So that's why these are the most important. But you don't hear their names because these guys like to pretend that they were the ones, okay? No, it's these two guys. Guess who they're fruits of? Could, could you guess who they're fruits of if they're able to have a large number of fundamentalists? J. Frank Norris. That's why he's a huge, profound influence that the Lord mightily used, J. Frank Norris, okay? Buchan, Vic, John Rawlings are fruits of J. Frank Norris. Now, unfortunately, they were splits from J. Frank Norris. That's a whole other story. Dr. Upman had a very funny story, you know, about that one, how he tried to get them all together playing a board game, you know, because they were close friends. And then uh, when he was driving one of the uh, wife's, uh, one of the misses home, he said, you're going to be in heaven together anyway, you know, why don't you just get together? And then the missus uh, said, if he is in heaven, you know, like that. <laughs> and then Dr. Ron was like, oh, come on, so you know he's in heaven, you know. And then she's like, well, let me tell you. And then she told him a thing, Dr. Ron said. <laughs> That's a whole other story. It's just a whole other story. But it's a very interesting, our history, where we come from. <laughs> but Buchamp, Vic, John Rawlings are the two people who started what is called, uh, you want to write them down, all right, but it's the Bible Baptist Fellowship, and I think it's called the World Baptist Fellowship. Again, the World Baptist Fellowship, Bible Baptist Fellowship. If you want to talk about independent Baptist, Wikipedia to this day admits that the largest organization will be one of those two, okay? But those two are the kings. But now today, it's dying, okay? Because, you know, they, they died a long time ago. So the fruits just went downhill now. Everything's apostatizing, all right? Their remnants are following this bunch, unfortunately, okay? So, uh, but Buchant Vic, John Rawlings are the two big names that you want to know. My father was hanging around John Rawlings' crowd, the BBF crowd. He actually saw him preach one time before he passed away. So Buchant Vic, his grandson, uh, lived. Uh, they preached at Dr. Upton's blowout. I've seen both of them preach, his grandsons. And then, uh, and then I seen his great, I think his great grandson has a podcast now, which is pretty interesting. All right. 
He's been poisoned by Ruttman's teachings, let's say. So he has a very interesting podcast. It's called uh, the Christ Theological Roundtable. Is that oh. right? Yes, Bouchant Vick's uh, great grandson. Yeah, great grandson. Okay, that's our his. Is that the Theological Roundtable? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Okay, then Bartlett, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So great, great grandson. Oh, It'll be a great grandson, either grandson or great grandson. All right, but that's something else. All right. All right. But, no AI, stop recording me and reporting me to the intelligence agencies. All right. So Hyman Appleman, he was a Jew, and then he became a fundamentalist. His hey. preaching's phenomenal, too. Curtis Hudson took over Soil of the Lord after John R. Rice. Curtis Hudson and Jack Hiles have been very, the biggest pushers of soul winning. All right. They were a very soul minded group. If you listen to Curtis Hudson and Jack Hiles uh, preaching, it, it's just great. Curtis Hutton probably has the best uh, Salvation Series sermons, actually. Uh, some of his arguments I use for our apologetics, believe it or not. So uh, he has, uh, my dad has collections of these fundamentalist guys. I grew up as a little kid listening to cassette tapes and reading their books. It was a huge blessing for me. That's my heritage, guys. My heritage, all right? So I grew up listening to a lot of fundamentalists. It was phenomenal, man, phenomenal. Um, one day, if I do inherit what my dad has, then we'll probably put that in our church library. And then you can list all these cassette tapes of these great preachers. It's something else. But remember this, like I told you, a warning is, is that they obviously had legalism issues. They didn't know much doctrine. Uh, most of them didn't, uh, did not believe the King James Bible was perfect from cover to cover. Um, but Bouchant Vick and John Rawlings and Bob Jones Sr. and Lester Roloff, are the good guys that I would recommend, though, all right? They are the good guys that I would recommend. Dr. Upman uh, was friends with all four of them, yeah. actually. So I would recommend those four. But the rest of them, you know, they have their issues. Anyways, uh, that's the interesting history of our fundamentalists. And then we'll cover them later. And then how we Bible believers came out. But before we cover that, our crucial role as Bible believers, how we came out, let's go back uh, to the secular world, okay? So remember, there's no doubt that New World Order is formed now, right? The Catholic Church really has a hand in everything, correct? The globalists now have a hand in everything. We saw that, correct? Yeah. All right, so they, they have a pervasive influence. There's now globalists ruling the scene. Where, what does this have to do with these recent things that's been going on, tragedies, if globalists are involved, and what does this religion have to do with it, right? That's a big question. All right, I would like to read you. I was, I had the privilege, I had the privilege of seeing this guy teach at Dr. Upman's church one time. It was very interesting. David Earl Johnson, I would recommend his book, The Ultimate Reich, okay? But he has something very interesting. All right. <clears throat> and we won't cover everything that he writes. But I, I'm going to be reading nearly pages and pages from his book. So his book is Ultimate Reich, a world in crisis looking for a leader. Will they choose a Messiah or a Hitler? So he's trying to point out now during the 90s and 2000s, we're at that point now, guys, where the globalists are in the scene. The church has apostatized now, right? The Catholic Church has taken over. Any moment now, you just need an Antichrist. Yeah. Okay, a couple pieces need to be in place, sure, but we're just right there at the borderline. So now I'm going to cover nearly pretty much current events now. So here we go, okay? So we know our history. Globalists have taken over. Let's see what's going on in our current events. So this will be our history from about 20 years ago, okay? Not too far, 20 to 30 years ago. David Earl Johnson writes on his book, page nine. This is something to think about, guys, okay? The world's six billionth inhabitant was officially born in Sarajevo on October 12, 1999. Some of the other 240,000 babies born that day might challenge that statistic, claiming that they were the six millionth. In fact, in the very same minute, statistically, six, six, six point six babies were born somewhere around the world. The world growth rate is 1.3%, which means it will double in 54 years. So in 2054, we can expect that 12 billion people will inhabit the Earth. Between World War I and World War II, the Earth's population was 2 billion. Can you believe that? Yeah. 
In the 1960s, it was up to $3 billion, and today it is a staggering $6 billion. But now it's a billion, right? How is it possible for the population to triple in living memory? And where does it go from here? I can remember scientists in the early 70s wringing their hands and wondering where the food was to come from to feed the starving multitudes of those days. However, Earth's population has doubled since then, and millions are starving around the world. Yet third world nations are multiplying too fast to count. The world today includes the following. China, 1.25 billion. USA, 280 million. India, 1 billion. And then he compares three religions. Islam, 1.2 billion. Catholic, 1.2 billion. Jews, 11 million. But now Islam is bigger, all right? But anyway, I think if you combine Catholicism and the, the Orthodox Church, uh, they could still have a play or bigger numbers. But anyway, that's just my personal opinion. Today's world contains more than a billion young people between the ages of 15 and 24, with the almost uncontrollable urge to mate. Most of them live in the developing world with no access to or interest in birth control, and they are inevitably going to continue to multiply the world's population by ever more staggering numbers. Nah. Some scientists have tried to set a numerical limit, suggesting that a population of about 2 billion people would be ideal. But who will choose who those 2 billion will be? And what will happen to the rest? When will the young people decide that the older generation is in the way and taking up too much of the food? Just so did Germany begin its campaign of control before the concentration camps came the killing of those taking up space. The old and the mentally sick went first. After them went the sick the homosexuals, the communists, and the gypsies. The area available for producing grain for each living person has diminished by half since 1950. Farmers now use land once considered unsuitable for growing crops. Forests are cut down to provide land for farming. But deforestation makes the land more vulnerable to floods. And land once used for farming is swallowed up into cities. The European Environment Agency describes the soil loss through erosion and development as worryingly high. As living standards improve, more and more people demand more and more meat. Not only does more meat filled with hormones and other growth producing chemicals bring more cancer and other diseases, but providing more meat is also counterproductive. Far more grain is required to produce animals for meat than for direct consumption. This is a guy you guys, you guys got to realize from 20 years ago, yeah. more than 20 years ago, he was on the ball. Mm -hmm. Now, if the elites are controlling the scenes and they know this stuff is happening, what do you think they're going to do then? See, you got to get your thinking caps on. Okay, what are they going to do? They have to take more control. They have to control societies, manage them somehow. They have to forcibly put things into play. But anyway, by 2050, the estimated amount of fresh water available for drinking will be 25% of that available in 1950. So with more than double the number of people, we have one quarter the amount of water. The Great Yellow River in China has dried up for a few months each year since 1985. And for 10 years, it actually went so dry that it could not even reach the sea. The water table in China is going down by a staggering five feet per year. With a fast-growing population, China will soon be forced to look elsewhere for water, and there will be none available. So why do you think China is in competition now? All right. Fish catches around the world have passed the point at which they can be replenished. There is not enough energy in the forms used today to supply all of our needs. Floods and famines are more and more evident throughout the world. Science no longer has any answers, only questions. The Serbs of Yugoslavia <coughs> had one answer as to how to stop the multiplication of our populations. However, ethnic cleansing is never the right answer. International Islamis, Islamists have more than one way of conquering. All right, so I will use M, okay, from henceforth. A country for Allah. While they have frequently over the past 1400 years mounted a direct assault with a massive army, M have also quite often introduced a few hundred people into a new country and instructed them to multiply as fast as they can. Thus it was in Yugoslavia with the Albanian M. 
The United Nations Statistics Division estimated that 50 years ago, the Albanian birth rate averaged 8.5 children to every woman. Not only is this probably higher than in any other country, but it meant that by the 1950s, the M outnumbered the Serbs by a little under 3 to 1. And by the 90s, by over 8 to 1. Little wonder that the Serbs were afraid of the M majority. So when their leaders put forward ethnic cleansing as a solution, many of them went along willingly to rid the land of the Albanian threat. Desperate people often resort to desperate measures. Yugoslavia is not the only country to have employed such desperate measures. In the African country of Rwanda, the population doubled in 30 years, leaving clearly not enough space or enough food for the population. Rakia Omar of Africa Rights has said, quote, the extraordinary pace of the birth rate and the very small space of Rwanda go a long way to explain the hunger for land, which then could be easily exploited by politicians to entice mass participation in genocide, end of quote. That's what he said, man. This is only 20 years, a year, 20 years ago, perhaps. Close to a million people were murdered in Rwanda. Millions were also eliminated in Russia and in China, as well as in other Asian countries. Analysts warned that the population now over 6 billion, and with the resulting shortages of food, water, and land, we must expect that other nations will experience similar genocides. The earth simply cannot adequately support her inhabitants. Natural disasters occur at a multiplied speed. Floods, famines, and wars destroy an ever-increasing number of the world's population. And some say these are nature's ways of keeping the population down to acceptable levels. But even these measures cannot keep the world population within the limits of its food supply. As proven by millions of malnourished children the world over, the United States, with its overabundance of food, cannot imagine that many parts of Africa are regularly ravaged by famine that causes the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people each year. The news that two million people in the Horn of Africa are likely to starve to death in the immediate future means nothing to us as we set our minds to politics, sports, and television shows. Wow. Yet while Americans regularly overload their plates and throw away leftovers in the garbage, in many parts of the world, children who could easily be saved with the scraps we disdain are dying. The scene in the back alleys behind hundreds of thousands of American restaurants every night of the week is appalling. Pounds of steak, chicken, and fresh vegetables are loaded into dumpsters to be taken off to the city dump. Perfectly good food wasted and unwanted while millions starve. You wonder why? If the majority of globalists are in a certain country, yeah. their country would be the best state. Is your thinking caps on? It reminds one of the most famous uh, statement of Mary Antoinette at the start of the French Revolution. When told that the people were hungry and had no bread, she reportedly said, quote, let them eat cake, end of quote. Marie lost her head to the guillotine soon thereafter when those poor peasants rose up in defiance at the French nobility's lack of concern for their plight. And there are people ready to revolt today in many parts of the world. They just want a leader. A recent World Health Organization study tells us that out of a world population of just over 6 billion, 3 billion have no sanitation and 1 billion have no clean water. It is not surprising that so many die from disease. In India, with its population of just over 1 billion people, frequent storms and floods kill thousands at one time. As we race to the sports page or flip the channel to see our favorite sitcom, Americans barely notice freak floods, tornadoes, and earthquakes. But a few weeks life in our memories, even when these things occur right here in the United States. When they happen in far off countries, they merit no more than a moment of thought before they are replaced by thoughts of new cars and stock market gains. Two great storms gripped Britain, one immediately following the other in the first few days of November 2000. British headlines read, quote, railways and roads grind to a halt, end of quote. Quote, Gale Strand 6,000 in Channel Ferries, end of quote. Quote, trail of devastation around the, across the country. Another one, town of Celsius struck by second tornado in two years. Another one, 6,000 flee homes and worse floods in 100 years. End of quote. The UK is experiencing the highest rainfall since before the American Revolution. And the London Daily Telegraph asks if the severe weather is a sign of divine displeasure. <laughs> If this little display of bad weather is a, is a sign of divine displeasure, 
then the serious floods, famines, and pestilence around the world must surely be a sign of divine anger. In India, the average family still insists that they need to have four children, and the government seems unable to convince them to reduce their goals even to two children, to at least stop the rise in population and allow it to level off. M leaders continue to teach their people to have as many children as possible to increase the percentage of the world that is M. Over the years, the Western countries have done a great deal to help the third world nations. Multiple millions of dollars have been raised by private organizations, while governments have supplied surplus grain and other products to help in many parts of the world. Yet, somehow, the needed help seldom gets to the starving masses. It is prevented by what? Globalists. And I don't mean the Western, I'm talking about even in those third world countries, corrupt globalists. See, globalists are always to blame, you have to realize. Leaders. It is prevented by political corruption in high places or by armies which grab the food to supply their troops before it can reach the stricken areas. Financial aid seldom seems to get through to the people. It is intended for as is siphoned off into Swiss bank accounts by corrupt leaders. While communism has supposedly fallen and capitalism reigns throughout the world, the fact is that vast areas of the world are still under very strict socialist regimes. We already studied that, right? It's a Catholic, communist culture now, modernism. China, North Korea, Vietnam, and Cuba come to mind, and the totalitarian regimes are not over yet in Russia and her republics. They have simply gone underground or changed their names. Now that Putin came out, now Democrats are even saying, you know, communist and attributing to Russia and all that. <laughs> Funny, isn't it, our world? But the leaders of these republics are in most cases still the strong men of the communist era. And the apparatus remains ready to bring the people into total slavery again at short notice. And even as close to the United States as Venezuela, the communist socialist conspiracy continues to subjugate nations in its slimy grip. We would studied that, right? Communist conspiracies infiltrating, but that's with Catholic too, all right? Poverty is an ever, I know that it's late. Let me finish, okay? I, I need to finish this, okay? It's important. I'm done. Poverty is an ever-present threat to most of the people of the world as corrupt rulers grab millions of dollars in aid for their countries and put it into their own bank accounts, our current globalists, right? People in many countries are ready to revolt against corruption. In many parts of the world, people are looking for a leader with almost magical powers to lift them out of poverty and starvation and bring solutions to the overwhelming problems of their miserable lives. What they are looking for, if they knew the word, is a Messiah. And along comes another warlord who claims to have the people's welfare at heart every single presidential election in every country around the world. With backing from the CIA, he forms an army and ousts the present regime to install himself as a new Western-style president. Yeah, we saw that, right? A year or two later, he has looted the resources of the country and opened a nice Swiss bank account for himself. It's no wonder people in third world countries are angry and in despair. They are looking for a savior, but all they ever get is another dictator. This guy knows his stuff. And worst of all, when a good leader does come along, most of them will not recognize him. Yes, hit the nail on the head. You get good leaders today, the world don't recognize that too. With famine, natural disasters, and poverty causing billions to starve or to live in abject poverty under harsh governments, a cry resounds for someone to lead them out of their misery. The United Nations was founded to help mankind realize its potential in peace and prosperity. Yet the United Nations has failed miserably. So much so that the United States refuses to even pay its dues to the world body. The United Nations is not the answer. But where does help lie? Is there an organization? a government, even a great wise man who can help sort out the world's troubles. Now many of the people in third world countries are looking outside the borders of their own countries for a leader to take over their land and bring peace and prosperity as none of their national leaders can. In the next few chapters, we will examine the situation in several countries and see why humanity is almost ready to put its fate into the hands of one great man of destiny. If only he can be found, they are looking for a messiah.
That's when we hit 90s and 2000s, guys. Why? Because what, what did God say? You forsake me, I forsake you. And they're all eating the fruit of their sin. Now, the Antichrist is about to set in. What does this have to do with M is intensely interesting. I'm going to read you pages from his book, which will be interesting. Then I'll refer to Grady's book, How Satan Turned America Against God. When you look at this, you're going to see their role in this. And so, but I had to start with the New World Order, okay? So now we're getting ready for a New World Order, an Antichrist. But what, I mean, you can, Catholicism we can guess. Judaism, we already know because the Bible said that. What do they play a part in, right? Why are they important? Dr. Upman didn't know how they would play a part in it, actually, even before. But he knew they had something to do with it. That prophet was right. Yeah, yeah he's quite a prophet himself. Today, I see it. I'm going to read you historical stuff. You won't be the same again after that. Okay, so wait till our next history class. You're going to drop your jaws, all right? It's incredible, our world, all right? And here's the thing. You'd be surprised they had connections with Hitler. I'm going to show you that one, all right? And then it's going to be eye-opening about Judaism and these two, their roles, all right? Well, anyway, next time, all right? Look forward to your next history class. Father God, dismiss us now with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.